Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, apologies for the somewhat snuffly uh, voice. I had a cold last week and it's not quite gone. Um, but I hope my voice is clear enough. Well, as you've heard, she was born in 1875. And I just want to pick up one or two things about her life and times, which, um, um, as it were, opened things up for the women of her generation. For, uh, and things now we, we take for granted, but we forgot what battles there were over them um, in her day. Um, I mentioned particularly uh, the Married Women's Property Act of 1885, which secured to women the uh, property and earnings they acquired after marriage, um, unlike, you know, um, very rich families where you'd have a settlement uh, of, of financial uh, resource on a woman that a husband couldn't get at and drink away or whatever. Um, um, very important in, a, in an increasingly industrialised culture. Um, then, of course, at the, end of the sec uh, at the end of the First World War, a small group of women, you had to be over 30 and have various property rights or be a university graduate or whatever it is, um, secured the right to vote. Um, and you had to be age 30 to be able to vote. A ma young man had just to be, I think, age 19 and uh, able to supply an address. Um, um, but the, the, um, the, the, these two things mark out the points at which um, women are uh, deemed to be, um, have persons in their own right, um, to have minds and wills of their own, and certainly to be in need of securing economic resources and um, education of a kind that had, in a way that had not been possible um, for them um, uh, uh, pre previously. Um, having mentioned university graduates, um, remember that they were at the time only about 1% of the population. To, so to say that you could vote as a woman age 30 if you were a university graduate, you know, it was a nice restriction. There weren't going to be too many of these nuisances um, uh, around. Um, now, as far as gaining education is concerned, remember that, um, th forget Oxford and Cambridge, it's always late and slow in these things. Um, uh, there were places where women could go to get a degree, but there, there weren't very many likely to be very many of those. So there was a problem about how you gained education after uh, school or, 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 or whatever. I mean, you had to work quite hard, hard to secure the kind of thing you wanted, particularly if you were interested in theology. Now, Archbishop Randall Davidson had, in 1905, established, under his aegis at Lambeth, a diploma in theology for women who wanted to, uh, some sort of qualification so they could teach scripture in schools and colleges and so on. But that was about the limit of their formal, quali the formal qualifications in theology um, open to them. And men would have probably only read theology anyway if they were going to be ordained, right? So... Um, in getting interested in the theology and doing the kind of things she did, um, she was quite extraordinarily uh, ex uh, in interesting and exceptional. It all happened more or less by um, accident. Um, the kind of thing that uh, 1905 and Randall Davidson establishing this diploma, you compare that with the kind of stuff you get in Charles Gore's commentary on St. Paul's official uh, epistle to the Ephesians, which was also published exactly the same date, 1905. Now, he goes in for the usual sort of sentimental rubbish about women, about how, you know, holy and, uh, um, uh, um, and, and devout they are and so on. Um, but, of course, um, taking his clues from the household codes um, in the New Testament and how they were interpreted in their, those days, um, women could only learn about theology, so he thought, from uh, the men in their lives and particularly their husbands. Uh, what he doesn't say is where the husbands learned their theology. Presumably it was at public school. Or, um, or from their uh, uh, preaching in church or, or whatever it was. So there's, you can see things are just on the cusp there. Archbishop Randall Davidson just nudging things in one direction, but the prevailing attitudes probably represented by Gore's um, commentary um, on, the, on the other. Now, she was, as it happened, um, very... Um, fortunate in her family context. She was born into the family of a, a, a distinguished lawyer who moved to London, well established there. Um, she was the, uh, the only child in the family. 
um, father and mother clearly va valued, fortunately, valued the talents of their intelligent little daughter. She had a very good education in languages, which of course were to be an absolute godsend for the kind of work that she was going to um, undertake. Um, they were well enough in all. To, to travel, she used to go to the continent with her mother, and not just to brush up her languages, but to, she started to take every opportunity to look at churches and shrines in Italy and France and uh, Scandinavia and so on, which opened up to her a whole world which had not been on offer to her quite so self-evidently in the Church of England of her day. And I think she went to the kind of rather perhaps dry as dust uh, kind of uh, Anglican church. I don't think the family had really engaged with the Oxford movement and the rebuilding of the churches and the redecoration that was going on um, at the time. And she learnt something very important from these experiences, which was, um, okay, she wasn't a full-scale participant, but you can learn a lot just by paying attention. You pay attention, you use your imagination, you learn to listen, to look, to keep your mouth shut. And you find that you get in, there are ways, in other words, of getting in under the skin of other people's modes of worship, other than by being, you know, fully baptised or fully confirmed or a fully participant, um, uh, uh, a member of a particular um, tradition. And this all feeds into her book of 1936, not long before she died, which is simply called Worship. It's never been surpassed. You probably couldn't do it write a book like that nowadays, you'd have to have a team of people doing it. But all these early experiences feed into that book, which is, okay, it's got its flaws, we all write books that have got flaws, um, uh, but which really gives you a lot of insight into different Christian traditions, at least in the Western world, um, and indeed in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, the Orthodox, of course, had begun to come west after you know, the Russian Revolution, all that kind of thing. She starts to get in under the skin of Orthodoxy as well. So when she writes about Western Christianity, and she is partic always particularly fascinated by Western Latin Roman Catholic Christianity, um, she keeps on saying, well, this is what I'm concentrating on. But of course, at this point, the, the Orthodox do such and such in their liturgy. She remains very fascinated by it, very open to what a lot of people must have found very strange, very oriental, um, somewhat weird, um, uh, frankly, in, in her day. Now, she went from, in, in 1893, um, to the newly appointed, newly opened ladies' department of King's College London, where um, it's now incorporated into the premises of Heathrock College in London, where she read history, she learned philosophy of a particular kind. She learned to trace great themes across the, the ages, um, to synthesize things, to cobble them together, not to be too analytic, not to bury people in too much detail, you know, make it possible for people to get hold of a whole sweep and scale of, 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 thing, of things. Um, she learned to make excellent use of libraries, some of which still contained what we used to refer to as scholar librarians, um, where people could, get, could help her find the kind of stuff she needed. Um, she met other like-minded scholars, some of whom collaborated with her on her, her late, later books. Um, she turned herself into what we would nowadays call an independent scholar, somebody like Margaret Barker, for example, if you know her, her name. Um, and um, she also um, discovered the chapel of Maria Assumpta in Kensington Square. And this was very important to her for two reasons. And whatever the problems are with the symbol, symbols associated with the Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the, in the Christian tradition, it, it did, did then and it still does, and certainly for Evelyn, Evelyn Underhill, represented as it were a place for the female feminine exalted to God. Um, because of the traditions associated with her. And that was something new to her, which remained very important. And also very important, she learnt about how in the, um, the ritual, this is, forget Vatican II and all that stuff and try and think, you know, uh, the Latin mass of the early 20th century. She also discovered there the symbolization, the way in which the priest, the celebrant, not the president, the celebrant, 
um, symbolized in his own person, recapitulated the life of Christ in the movement of the Mass, doing all that, of course, on behalf of his congregation, uh, which, which he took with her. And she's got a very interesting and important little book, which is largely overlooked, called The Mystic Way of um, 1913, where she explores uh, this. She has she rediscovers Christ as the first mystic in a sense that I'll explain. Um, then she thinks that Christian other mystics and particularly ordained Christian priests re represent what Christ uh, uh, represented um, in, 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 the, in the Mass. And whatever you make of all this, and some people immediately said she was talking rubbish, uh, particularly about Christ as a mystic, I do think she hit on something very important here. If you're ever engaged in the happy task of liturgical revision, or being on the receiving end of yet one more revision um, of uh, the text with which you're supposed to worship, um, she, wants, she wants how you think about Christ meshed in with you know, what this text is, is doing, how it's engaging people, what the president is doing, and so on. Whether that's a principle that work in the minds of liturgical reformers, I really wouldn't know. I doubt it. Now, she seriously con considered becoming a Roman Catholic, but by this time, she, she, well, she became engaged to a, a man who'd been a close personal friend for years, another lawyer, um, Hubert uh, Stuart Moore. And he, he jibbed, he jibbed, he didn't want to marry a Roman Catholic, thank you very much. So that was one problem. Um, they married in 1907. The other problem was the condemnation of modernism by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the modernists were uh, people who wanted to engage with um, the history and traditions and doctrines of the church um, in relation to new sciences, um, history, politics, philosophy, biblical texts, and so on. And once they'd been more or less slapped down, um, uh, she, she was quite clear about where she, she stood. She was a modernist, and she wasn't going to be told, you know, what she was going to read or how she was going to use it. Thank you very much. Um, she tried to establish herself as a poet and a novelist, um, but um, had the good sense to realize that she wasn't going to make, make it into the realms of the great and the good there. So, she, and she became fascinated by um, religion and religious tradition. She explored all sorts of what we now call rather wacky um, uh, movements of one kind, kind, or, kind or another. Um, by the time of her marriage and the condemnation of modernism, she'd got well into the drafting of her first great book, which is simply called Mysticism, completed in 1910, uh, published in 1911. Um, it went through four editions by 1912, 12 editions by 1930. It's never been out of print. Um, it completely ignored in the Church of England in 2011, as far as I could see. They're not in the United States. Um, the subtitle is important. It's a study in the, in the nature and development of man's spiritual consciousness. So you have to take some of this flower, rather, perhaps flower, flowery language on board and see what she's, she's getting at. And mysticism, she understands to be, I quote, the expression of the innate tendency of the human spirit towards complete harmony with the trans transcendental order. And then she says, whatever be the theological formula under which it's to be understood. Now that's very contentious, you know, whether it's all really the same. If you, you know, get underneath the, 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 the language, that's, that's pretty contentious. But anyway, that's where she stood at the time of writing the book. And this enabled her to do something else that was um, contentious, which was to pay attention to non-Christian religious traditions, centuries older than uh, Christianity, and of course associated with these inferior, subordinated, colonial subjects of the British Empire. So, I mean, some people must have found that a bit offensive, I think. But, um, she, you know, she, she's avid for translations of... Um, of the, the, uh, the, the great saints and mystics of a whole variety of um, um, traditions. Um, she looked at the philosophy of her day, the psychology of her day, anything that would eliminate the human psyche. Um, she knows, of course, that when people get hooked into religion, they can uh, exhibit some pretty bizarre 
mystics. Very strange, difficult behaviour. So she wants to distinguish the mystics from, uh, or, or true mysticism, even if some of their behaviour is bizarre. She wants to d distinguish them from um, people who dabble in alchemy and magic, people who want to get hold of power and manipulate it. Um, that's basically what it's about. Um, uh, and so she writes, writes this this, this great compendium, which very helpfully includes a splendid list at the back if you go there. If you don't know the, the people she's talking about, uh, they're all written out at the back, you know, nice little biographies. She says there's nothing more maddening um, to be, um, have somebody talking to you about people you, to whom you haven't even been introduced. You know? So you've got these nice introductions at the back. And um, she, um, the, 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 the book is so popular, she goes on rewriting it and rewriting of a different attention so it gets fatter and fatter and fatter fatter and fatter um, if you buy a modern edition of it you'll find it minus footnotes and bibliography uh, which is a pity in a way okay we don't always want to read through all this stuff but there's a sense in which it does she does illuminate for you the scholarship of her day and she also tells you that she's done her homework jolly thoroughly you know she really knows um, who it is she's um, been talking to um, she rebalances her emphasis a little bit. She talks less about human aspiration to God and a lot more about the uh, divine grace and how, how you receive it as the years go on. Because as she learnt, as we all learnt in the first part of the 20th century, um, human aspiration to God can take people to some pretty dangerous and uh, damaging um, places. Um, and... The, the point of what she's writing um, is that she was trying to persuade people um, that everybody, it, it, this was open to everybody. It's not for the elite, it's not for people especially brainy or uh, having extraordinary gifts of any kind. This is absolutely for the most ordinary person. Um, it was possible for anyone to know uh, that they were being grasped and transformed by divine love. Um, and it's divine love as mediated by religious tradition. Not rules, not morality, but love um, in religion, that's mediated by religious tradition, which awakens and fosters our capacity to respond to re the reality we acknowledge as divine, other than ourselves, other than our world, but which still mysteriously um, per pervades it. And she writes of... Um, she, she talks about... Um, not just people in religion, but musicians, artists, scientists, three cheers. Um, people writing out of suffering, out of experience of beauty, um, whatever. Um, she says the mystic experience is the key to them all. And what she means by this is um, an experience which is infused with burning love. For it seems to its possessors to be primarily a movement of the heart with intellectual subtlety which ardour is wholly spent upon the most sublime object of thought, with unflinching will, for its adventures are undertaken in the teeth of the natural doubts, prejudices, languors, and self-indulgences of man. These adventures, looked upon by those who stay at home as a form of higher laziness, are in reality the last and most arduous labours which the human spirit is called upon to perform. The only known methods by which we can come into conscious possession of all our powers and rising from the lower to the higher levels of consciousness, become aware of the larger life in which we're immersed, attain communion with the transcendent personality in whom um, that life is resumed. So, and that's what, she, that's what she's really writing about there, is the experience of Christ, as she reads the experience of Christ in the Gospels. That's what she means by saying, Christ is, is a mystic, somebody who goes through this uh, aspiration, cleansing, um, and is eventually um, united with, with God and so on. So, uh, the language of human passion is tepid and insignificant beside the language in which the mystics try to tell the splendors of their love. They force upon the incredulous readers the conviction that they are dealing with an order far more burning for an object far more uh, uh, real. 
well, this must have been quite startling in, you know, let's think of the Britain of their, Britain of their day, in which people weren't really any more than they are now, perhaps, um, accustomed to thinking seriously about their emotions and the engagement of their emotions in, in relation to God. And also, um, uh, remember that it comes um, just before the First World War, and the, de the devastation, the horrors of that war, uh, for people, it must have uh, been a kind of resource for those who survived, in whatever form, or those who were uh, those who were uh, bereaved um, and uh, devastated by loss of one one kind or another. Um, uh, otherwise, I mean, it, you can't otherwise account for um, the fact it went on being uh, published and republished, and of course for the popularity of the other books uh, that she wrote. Um, and not everybody was going to wade through a great big fat book on mysticism, but there were lots of short books that she wrote uh, which, which got her message across. And she also wanted to alert people to what she calls them the, the Christliness of the natural world. She wanted us to um, get through the sort of barriers that sometimes seems to separate us from um, the, the non-human. And take this um, little example. Look with the eye of contemplation, she writes, on the most dissipated tabby of the streets, and you shall discern the celestial quality of life set like an aureole about his tattered ears, and hear in his strident mew an echo of the deep enthusiastic joy, the raptures of the hallelujah sent from all that breathes and lives. The sooty tree up which he scrambles to avoid escape your endless gaze is holy too. It contains for you the whole divine cycle of the seasons. Upon the plane of quiet, its inward pulse is clearly to be heard. I mean, she's very good at getting, you know, getting the right kind of illustration um, to, to get people um, see what she's um, getting after. Now, you might imagine Dad at home, you know, this lawyer, thinking, as she's... She doesn't explicitly say it's father at one point, but she says, you know, there's somebody saying, Dad, well, what's the use of all this, you know? Um, but she says of the mystical character, not now of the mystical experience, the kind of character that can be formed by this aspiration to God, the recipient of divine grace, its chief ingredients are courage, singleness of heart, and self-control. It's towards the perfection of these military virtues, not to the production of a pious so soft softness, that the disciplines of mysticism are largely direct directed. Uh, tension ardor of its essence, it demands the perpetual exercise of industry and courage. She's no time anywhere in her life for what she calls weary willy sort of piety. Um, and again, you can imagine how that might have been very important and still could be very important in, 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 um, in, in our, our, our time. Well, um, she, like many another, uh, worked during the Second World War. She worked in naval intelligence, as it happened. Uh, the family also had the experience of losing some of their splendid young men um, in the war. And the more she learned about the war, uh, as, as the men came home, and people really talked about, you know, how absolutely disgusting and awful it had been. Um, this turns her from a supporter of war. You can guess from what, what I've said so far about military virtues is. And that turned her from being a supporter of war into a radical pacifist. Um, and that was true, of course, of a lot of people um, between the wars. Big pacifist movements, the trouble is they didn't have any pe political clout. And certainly, as we now know, uh, politicians really didn't know what to do about the Spanish Civil War, or, or worse, the rise of fascism in its two major forms, National Socialism in Germany and Stalinism. Um, it, well, Italy, of course, and uh, the whole thing associated with Stalinism in, in, in Russia. You know, lots of dithering, what are we going to do about this until it was too late to uh, take action. Now, uh, but she... Um, uh, first of all, after the war, um, she took a direction from the great Bar uh, Baron Friedrich uh, von Hugel, who was um, perhaps the greatest lay Roman Catholic theologian of his day, and interestingly, never encouraged her to leave the Church of England. He said, you stay where you are, that's, that's where God 
wants you to be, okay? And so she um, reconstituted herself in public as a member of the Church of England in 1921. Um, and um, by this time, of course, she was well established professionally, as one might say, a self-made profession, completely unpredictable um, from her origins and her background, and nobody else did it either. Um, she spoke at conferences, she spoke at learned societies, including the Aristotelian Society, for goodness sake. Um, she lectured on the spiritual life and uh, the vocational mystic and education to ordained clergy, dear me. Um, she was the first woman lecturer, a lecturer um, to give lectures under the auspices of the Faculty of Theology in Oxford in 19. Um, uh, 20. She became a fellow of King's College London in 1927. Um, the University of Aberdeen, to its eternal credit, offered her an, an honorary DD in 1938, but by that time she was beginning to suffer from um, asthma and bronchitis and not really be well enough to uh, make, make long journeys. But she produced 39 books, either single authored or in tandem with, with others, about 350 articles on a rough count. Um, uh, and as I said earlier, um, the other book of hers, um, which she uh, needs to be uh, remembered, is this great book on worship, which she somehow they got together um, in 1936. And if you're only going to dip into one chapter of her writing, and, um, I suggest you look at the chapter there on sacrament and sacrifice. This notion of sacrifice and Christ's sacrifice and Christ seeing his own death as a sacrifice, of course, is what inspires her own stance as a pacifist, as a Christian pacifist um, by this time. And how this was expressed, apart from the retreat she gave, was in her um, parish life, she formed prayer groups, prayer groups for um, intercession. Um, what she called, you know, the deliberate vulnerability of standing in the gap between what, what, how she saw the world's needs and um, divine love. And just let me give you two quote, concluding quotations from her work. Um, one is from Worship. She says, The hard, the exacting, the intolerant cannot worship. For worship is a confident approach to the infinite charity. And to hear the general humility which recognises our common fragility and need of pardon is the only passport. I think that's saying something very important about how we approach either our own engagement with worship or indeed look at, look at or participate in somebody else's. And just one example of her, her prayers um, which expresses her pacifism, I think, the approach to infinite charity, our humility and all the, the need, humidity we need and everything. Um, this is in wartime, okay. We should not forget that as Christians we are specially bound to pray for our enemies. Not only for the innocent people of Germany, but also for those who have brought this evil and misery on the world. We should ask God to have compassion on their sins and mistakes and support them in their sufferings. To save us from the spirit of hatred and bitterness and bring us to a just and lasting peace. And we should especially pray for all children in whom hope of the future rests. So there we are, I hope I've given you a sufficient introduction to her. Thank you. Thank you.